Welcome to the High Road. My name is Mark, and on the High Road, we're going to be exploring the hundred billion dollar cannabis industry. It's an industry that big is a lot of people involved. So we're going to be talking to growers, dispensary, doctors using it for pain management, scientists, celebs, and athletes with their own brands, and everyday people who are getting the benefits of this magical herb. As we crisscross the country, come on board on the High Road. First stop on the high road, we're heading to the Artist Tree in West Hollywood, California, where Hollywood is famous for its rock and comedy clubs on the legendary Sunset Strip at Santa Monica Boulevard, a city of 35,000 people right in the middle of Los Angeles. While some areas are trying to keep out dispensaries, not West Hollywood, which has been welcomed them and dubbed Little Amsterdam. The Artist Tree is one of the most unique dispensaries around with thousands of dollars of artwork and a cannabis cafe. Let's head inside. We're talking to Patrick Malarkey, the manager of the artistry. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to have you, man. Now, West Hollywood is its own city in the middle of LA. So what makes this place so unique to the community? The city of West Hollywood is really friendly to cannabis businesses. They are one of the only places in the general area of Southern California that has all different sorts of licenses available for cannabis businesses. And so that's one of the things that brought us here, but it's also the fact that like art is inherently important to this community and it's also inherently important to our brand. And I'd argue to cannabis more broadly. How do you get your art into the artistry? So that's a really excellent question. <laughs> so we, uh, we collaborate with a gallery owner and an art curator. Okay. Um, and so while a lot of our work is done with them, because part of our brand is tethering ourselves to the communities where we're opening our shops. And one of the things about our shops is wanting to be a part of that community. So we, we encourage anybody that has an artistry anywhere near them, check out our website. There's a portal for artist submissions, and then we'll be reaching out to you if we're interested. So who comes in to the artistry? And we want literally everybody. We want people that are old heads, that are super particular about their cultivars and like what exactly they're looking for. We want them to feel served by the artistry. We also want someone that is coming in being like, what is weed? And then right. feel service and feel invited in to spend time in our space. Um, and then the cafe is just really an extension of that. So like one of the things that's really important about the cafe is a further sort of bond with the artistic community. Our events that we're putting on were intentional about featuring local artists. We were chatting before about we're doing comedy nights and we feature local LA comics at those comedy nights. We've got live music that features a local jazz artist. And I'm doing comedy myself. I've never been in a place where people are, are getting smoking weed. We're at a comedy show and it just lends itself to comedy because you just want to laugh and have a good time. I have uh, moderate to severe Crohn's disease and I medicate my disease almost entirely with cannabis. I'm really particular about my diet, which is really important mm -hmm. with uh, GI conditions. But the thing that goes back to helping me with virtually all of my symptoms is cannabis. And like, I had that experience at the artistry, and that's the thing that brought me to this company. It was this was the first shop that I walked into that I did feel invited, like we were just talking about. And then also, I was able to walk up to a bud tender and be like, "Hey, do you have any strain specific or terpene infused tinctures?" And they didn't just look at me like I was crazy. They were like, oh yeah, we yeah. have this particular tincture in from Friendly Farms. And that was perfect for me. And so like cannabis and being involved in the cannabis space is about spreading the gospel that not only is it a safer, more friendly recreational intoxicant, it is truly a medicine for a lot of people. And it's phenomenal to be able to share that. Do you find that there's an increase of people coming in specifically just for CBD? Absolutely. Um, I think that CBD is, I love CBD mm -hmm. and I think that CBD and really what it means to the market more broadly is really important. So like what you're identifying, right? Like THC, CBD, they're both different cannabinoids that are present in the cannabis plant. There are hundreds of cannabinoids present in the cannabis plant. And right. so like, as we're moving forward with legalization, right, whenever we do move to a future of descheduling and we're able to actually do more research, we're going to be able to identify CBD, but also so many other cannabinoids that are therapeutic in exactly the same capacity that CBD is. Because one of the cool things about CBD, right, it elicits that sense of physical relaxation that a lot of people really right. enjoy and is really therapeutic for them. It's also, it works on the same receptor in the brain as THC. 
So ironically enough, if you're taking CBD and THC together, you're going to tamp down your psychoactivity by making them compete for that receptor in the brain. And so like the other thing that you're touching on that I think is really important to recognize about cannabis going forward, right, is that like you have an endocannabinoid system and I have an endocannabinoid mm -hmm. system. We are producing these chemicals in our bodies all of the time. It's what regulates our body temperature. It's how we feel hungry. It goes back to our mood regulation. And so whenever we're introducing these phytocannabinoids from the cannabis plant, we're going to have different things that fit our individual puzzle pieces differently. And that's why yeah. like, we, that's why cannabis is such a fun subculture, right? Because there's so many variations of the way that people enjoy the plant, exactly for the reason that we all experience it a little bit differently. I use CBD uh, for my dog too. Yeah. And, and, and it just really helped with like helping with appetite or reducing nervous and stress. If you want to come hang out, do some work, where are you going to go? Here to the artist tree. And that's what makes it so special. Patrick, thank you so much for showing us around this beautiful dispensary. We learned a lot. We got to see some beautiful artwork. So if you're in LA or Fresno, Make sure you stop in to the artist train. See Patrick, see the bud tenders. Patrick, a pleasure. Mark, it was a pleasure having you. Thanks for stopping by, man. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching The High Road. Coming up next on The High Road, we have a very special guest. It's Dr. Ari Grice, who's the director of the Medical Cannabis Department of Rockland Orthopedic Institute out of Philadelphia, and is using cannabis to help his patients manage pain. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We're excited to have you on the show. So what type of patients do you see at your practice? I'm a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician, and I uh, treat chronic orthopedic pain. So lots of back pain and uh, neck pain and other arthritic problems like knee and hip arthritis. Well, this is why I'm so excited to have you on the show. A few years ago, I ruptured disc in my back. I could barely walk. It was going to be months and months of rehab. The doctor out here wanted to give me opioids. And I said, no, I want to use cannabis to manage pain. And he kept telling me there's not enough research and kept pushing the opioids. And I refused the script. So listening to what you're saying, I think so many people will benefit from using cannabis over opioids and risk getting addicted. I trained kind of uh, in, in the height of the uh, marketing to physicians to use opioids for treating pain. And uh, unfortunately, I was uh, uh, present for lots of drug rep sponsored lunches, uh, touting the benefits of long acting opioids. I got into practice, I realized what a problem opioids were, especially for chronic pain conditions where the, essentially the symptoms weren't anticipated to go away. Uh, if there's one um, medical condition that there is some research to support the use of cannabinoids, it's, it's to treat chronic pain in adults. What we've been doing at Roth and Orthopedics is providing access to medical cannabis for chronic pain of various sorts, collecting outcome measures, and trying to do some research on what, what works for people and um, you know uh, what are the best dosages and routes of delivery. So I find it fascinating that cannabis is legal in most states, either recreation or medical use, but federally it's listed as a schedule one drug, which is the most restrictive. It's the same as heroin. So because of the status, does it inhibit the type of research that you can do? Right now, it's really the, the regulatory landscape that's limiting some of our ability to do these research studies. So how would you compare cannabis to opioids as far as pain management and damage to the body. Most of my patients are able to find dosages that aren't very intoxicating, that really minimize the risk of developing any problem use, and usually provide some degree of pain relief. And uh, the more I use cannabis to treat chronic pain, the more I find that it's a safer alternative to opioids for sure. And for some of my patients, it's even safer than using over-the-counter anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen or acetaminophen, which is what's found in Advil and Tylenol. Um, so I, I think it's much less physically damaging to the human body. And uh, for a lot of patients, it's just about finding the right dosage or route of delivery. Thanks for being on the show. And if you're in Philadelphia, go see Dr. Grice at Rockman Orthopedic Institute. 
and like to check in with you for future episodes. Anytime, Mark. Next up on the high road, we're going to be heading out to a mountain state. Not Colorado, it is Montana with a population of just over a million people. They have over 400 dispensaries. It's a lot of dispensaries for the population. We're going to be talking to Zach Block, who left the entertainment industry, who now owns Montana Canna. Excited to see what it's like in Montana. Welcome to the show, Zach. So how did you get into the cannabis industry? I actually got introduced to CBD in 2018 uh, by working with professional skateboarders. And a lot of those guys were taking it for ankles and knee health, uh, you know, joint pain and stuff. So um, I started sending boxes of CBD products up to Montana uh, to be sold in retail. And the market was healthy. And I thought, okay, well, my home state is ready for cannabis. Um, this is going to go recreationally legal sooner than later. Can you talk about your business model and some of the products that you have? And so we have a, a, a brand new um, designed facility for cannabis growing, and, and that's all been done in house. You know, um, we grow great weed at Montana Cannabis Company. And in January of this year, 2022, um, state went recreational. So it sounds like it's a lot of work to have a full product line. We had to be set up uh, vertically integrated. So we grow our own product. We process and extract. Uh, we make our own edibles. We do our own vape pens. So we kind of have the, um, you know, the, the full circle. And now it's allowable for us to purchase and sell business to business on the wholesale marketplace. But what are some of the advantages of being involved this heavily in the business. We're a single business, but we're doing four different things. We're a farm, we're a lab, we're a kitchen, and we're a retail dispensary. So there's all different um, individual, you know, idiosyncrasies involved with, with managing and operating each of those. But it's, for the most part, the same group of people. I'm growing plants, um, I'm baking things, I'm selling flour. Uh, so it's, I think the customers appreciate that, that, that wouldn't fly in a lot of markets, but here in Montana, um, people can come in and, and ask for a recommendation on a product and we know everything that went into it, um, how it was produced and what effects it's going to uh, deliver to the customer. And that's, that's service. And of course, not everybody can do that. That's a, uh, you know, we will likely scale out of that. But right now I'm grateful for that. And uh, so are our customers. On this episode, we talked a lot about the medical benefits of cannabis. So what type of patients come in and use it for medicine? We see people for um, everything from insomnia, uh, appetite, um, stimulant, uh, cancer treatment, pain management. All right, let's talk flour. What are some of the strains and the effects that you carry? But I would say if you want to chill out, we're going to go with a Mellows, which is a spritzer crossed with a great gasoline. And it's just like the name. It's super chill. It's a, it's a nice body high. There's not going to be a whole lot psychoactive uh, effect happening there. If you want something that's going to make you laugh and giggle, we're going to hit our RBC strain. Um, or if you want to be social, um, while still having a good time and a fairly obvious effect, we're going to go with our Huckleberry Express. And those are, those are you know, low 20 potencies uh, with various flavor profiles and terp profiles. Uh, if somebody wants to be knocked out in bed, we'll hit them with a, uh, with a Canna Montana strain or um, our butterscotch seems to be really heavy every grow. So yeah, it, it just comes down to the customer and what they're asking for and we can make a recommendation. So Zach, where do you see the future of cannabis? I hope and I believe that cannabis can change the world. And so that's the energy we put into our product. I'm hoping and willing that these products go out to people to improve their lives. We believe cannabis can use the world. So I encourage people to get educated on it have fun, um, improve their life, and use responsibly. Next stop on the high road, we're going to Culver City, California to catch up with film and TV writer Georgia Menendez, who uses cannabis to help with her creative process and also for a medical condition. She's really busy. We got a few minutes to talk to her. Welcome back to the high road. We're here with accomplished screenwriter Georgia Menina. She has two full features out, one being half New Year, the other still green, and she's working on 
two other movies and a TV show. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Can you tell us how cannabis helped inspire some of your writing projects? I would almost go farther than that. It's okay. not just that cannabis inspired. Cannabis is the ignition. When I get stuck, like let's say I, I get back into this world and I'm, I'm not, I get out of the head of my characters and I smoke, I can snap right back in. Um, I genuinely don't know how I would make a living um, if it weren't for pot. Besides writing, you said you also use cannabis to help with your Tourette's. So how does cannabis help your Tourette's and also maybe compare it to other medicines that you were taking too? So um, I was diagnosed with Tourette's as a kid, um, but it came back in full force after an operation um, in my 40s. And uh, I tried a lot of different medications, um, including Orac, Halodol. These are old antipsychotics and they made me so tired that I, I couldn't write or, or do much. And um, I read that weed could make a difference with Tourette's. So I started trying different kinds and it does make a difference. I can almost watch myself about to tick, deliberately make a competitive response and that is starting to get more and more natural. For those in the medical community who aren't prescribing cannabis, what would you tell those? I, I would say it's like you're fighting a war with a stick when you have a gun. So I, I would say that really when it comes to my, my livelihood, my health, my social, my self-confidence, I mean, it, weed is the, is the central point of all of that. Georgia, thanks for being on the high road and make sure to check out her movies. You can go to Amazon Prime to watch Half New Year and on the EO app, download it and watch Still Green. Next up on the high road, we're going off to Hollywood. That's right. Thousands of people each year chase their dreams in Hollywood. And if you're in the music business, you got to go see my main man, Mark Solomon, who's worked with some of the biggest names in the business. He's all about having a connection through cannabis and inspiring you as an artist. So let's check in with some of the stuff that he's working on. Well, let's go. I am here with Mark Solomon. What's up, folks? Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Mark. Now, Mark is an incredible musician. He's an engineer. He's an entrepreneur. But Mark, can you tell us about some of your ventures and how it relates to cannabis? Let me tell you, bro. Um, okay, welcome to my studio. Um, this is a safe space, a creative space, you know. I try to make it so everybody feels comfortable and they are getting the, the best work of their career. Yeah, no, and, and do you also feel that there's a connection when you see someone smoking weed? Um, we love, we <laughs> love cannabis, dude. And uh, it just helps us to make uh, our finest masterpieces and it gives us the patience to dig into stuff. Find out that somebody's a stoner, I'm like, yes. We can be friends now. Yeah, I like my old my old dudes who smoke weed because they're just they're they write great songs and they're just cool to be around. Wouldn't you love to hang out with Willie Nelson? I would. I've been obsessed with Willie Nelson lately, and yes, I would love to hang out with Willie Nelson. What I like about this space is that you're empowering artists. Sure, you know my main focus is to lift up independent artists. You know, like may, maybe somebody hasn't reached the point where they are as refined as JC or you know something to that effect. But ultimately, this is a space that people can come and work out their ideas in the form of a recording or a live performance that you can either stream or just record the videos for. So ultimately, this space is a place to lift up independent artists. And you also are doing merchandise. Totally. Here's one, Mark. Oh, look at that. This is Slow Mo King Records. That's my label. Personally, got some hats made from R. Yeah, we did. And what I like about it is they're not that expensive. You're not trying to gouge people. Totally. You're trying to empower people yep. so then they can make money because it's so hard mm -hmm. when you're starting off or an independent artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been feeling this way for a long time. I feel like the, the biggest problem these days is that it feels like every man for themselves when you're an artist, you know? So there's not a lot of companies that are there solely for the benefit of the artist, you know, like, so, and I'm just so tired of my friends telling me how broke they are. So like, if, if we can do a live concert and sell online tickets, that's been really fun. If we can make uh, 20 hats and sell them each for whatever you want to sell them to, or just give them to your biggest supporters. I mean, I have it set up to where I have three cameras on a switcher. So we're effectively like a TV station. So 
ultimately we can be in here playing our songs and people could tune in on YouTube or on Facebook and Hey, we could, we could ask for donations ahead of time for even to tune in. I'll tell you the first show we did last week was our first donation based show. We raised $300 in the first day. Making $300 for an artist is, is, is amazing. Totally. Cause most of the time you're not going to make anything, you're but actually 300. Yeah. Not at a venue. And, and you've probably been to places where you actually have to buy tickets so you can perform. Dude, yeah. So now you're in debt to yeah. perform. Dating in LA and yeah. playing shows in LA are pretty much the same. They both suck. <laughs> I've got recording sessions with you, and the sessions are not that much, and you actually coach right, right, right. along the way. Because mm -hmm. I care. You do care. Mm -hmm. And so I came starting off, I would do, um, I was doing like hip hop uh, acapella comedy for a show, and I'd never been inside a recording studio. And I was super raw. So where did that come from, the passion? Because a lot of people are just like, all right, show up. They don't want to coach at all. They just want to record and then done, on to the next session. Dude, um, I got to hang out with the guy that engineered the Beatles, Sir Jeff Emmerich. No way. That's amazing. Yeah, I did not know that. Um, I've yeah. heard of the Beatles. They're like an oh, up-and-coming yeah. band. band. Yeah. I know. I got to hang out with the engineer from Abbey Road. Um, he also did the Beach Boys, Paul Simon, Garfunkel, like everything that went through Abbey Road in that time. I got to hang out with Jeff Emmerich. Wow. He came and he sat right here. The art that it has sort of that he was referring to, what he was so mad about was because, yeah, we have gotten lazy, but really just because nobody's empowering people to be their best selves, you know, you know, people expect me like to fix a terrible take. And I say, you know what, why don't you give me five more takes in the spirit of Jeff Emmerich? That's what he would have wanted, you know. So, you know, I, I uh, that experience really helped me to be a better coach producer and yeah, today we were doing a voiceover session a notable that was recorded on this mic was uh rich the kid and, and uh little yachty fresh off the boat i recorded on this microphone what i got going on over here is i have three cameras that are going to the switcher and they are being displayed on this screen over here. So when we do our live stream performances, we get the full experience. Yeah, yeah I love getting stoned and playing with this thing. Thank you, Mark, for being on the high road. If you need any recording or live sessions, you're gonna see Mark at Slow Mo Kings. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome, brother. Let's go. All right, bye guys. When people ask me, why did I want to do a show about cannabis? Was it just an excuse to sit around, smoke weed, and act real silly? Well, that is a stereotype that I was looking to smash. As you can see in this episode, cannabis users are productive members of society, not the burnouts or the slackers that you typically see in film and TV. And that was evident as soon as you walked into the artistry, where people from all walks of life were doing work at the cafe and that sense of community that they're building with comedy, music, and yoga. And up in Montana with Zach, you can just see the passion that he has because he's so integral in the business and his customers, they appreciate it. And with Dr. Ari Grice, who is saving people's lives by managing their pain with cannabis, a safer alternative than opioids. Well, what's next for the high road? I mentioned earlier that's a multi-billion dollar industry. There's a lot of people that work in the field, so you want to hear their story. And if you have a story about cannabis and it positively affecting your life, well, hit me up here, because I want to hear from you. Time for me to go, so I can bring you more episodes of The High Road. I'm Mark Gordon, thanks for watching. Oh, there's, there's some music at the end too. Credits. It's a cool song. I like it. Just, just wait a little bit longer. We on the high road. We on the high road. We on the high road. Checking out dispensaries, growers, slams with their own brands. Talking to medical professionals, cannabis, billion-dollar industry. Let's hit the high road. Let's go.